And thank you all. Um, isn't this a fantastic and incredible conference? Yes, yes right? So yeah, uh, um, I would like to thank Mark and Yoshi for organizing this crazy event again. So thank you very, 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 very much. And thank you, of course, for being here and for staying this long. Uh, and thank for all the speakers who inspired me very, very much. I thought it was an incredible conference, uh, well worth much more than 30 euros, if you ask me. So, uh, 10 years ago, I was here, and back then I had a different job. I was still working at a de design agency uh, as a front-end developer. Uh, and to be honest, I didn't really like my job. I only pretended that I liked my job. Uh, so I would be here on stage and tell you all these inspiring stories. But the job itself wasn't that nice. Uh, I mean, yeah, it just wasn't that good. And I switched jobs, and it was actually good. So 10 years ago, I became a teacher, a lecturer at the University of Applied Sciences in Amsterdam, where I teach the next generation of digital designers to become front-end developers, to do the job that I don't like to do anymore, <laughs> uh, basically. Um, 10 years ago, I gave a talk about uh, the question, do we have to reinvent the wheel? Back then, we were working on responsive design. Responsive design was still a bit new, and I thought, maybe we can look at other industries to see if we can learn a thing or two from them, right? We don't have to do everything ourselves. So I looked, for instance, at tattoo artists because tattoo artists have been working on canvases that grow, right? So I thought, we work on devices that are smaller and bigger. Um, so back then, the answer to this question was no, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. This time, I think maybe we do need to reinvent some wheels because I've, I think we have been driving on maybe squares for the last 20 years. Um, but before we get there, let me talk about myself a little bit because I think this was very inspirational uh, that everybody, it was so personal, this conference. So I added a few slides about myself. So 10 years ago, I switched job, became a lecturer, and I decided to work less because I have a kid. And kids are nice till a certain age. After a certain age, well, they're still nice, but not that nice. Or, well, nice in a different way, let's just say it that way. But there's a few years where you really need to be with your kids. Uh, and in these years, we had this old Mercedes. I bought a, a bucket of paint and I painted it to look like a heavy metal car, right? Um, and, but it was nice paint because this is actually blackboard paint. So we could draw monsters onto the car. Uh, this is a drawing by my kid, actually. She is a really good monster drawer. Um, so we had lots and lots of fun with this car. This is one of the projects that I did. So I like to do things, well, maybe a little bit differently. This is actually something that I wanted to do as a kid. I wanted to draw on cars, of course. Who wanted to draw on cars? Everybody wants to but we're not allowed to. And I said, no, this is not gonna happen to my kid. My kid can draw on our car. Uh, so this is a weekend out with the friends. This is it beautiful. And then it starts raining and it looks like a heavy metal car again. And uh, this is the final uh, destination. Here it goes to the graveyard for old chalkboard cars. <laughs> so that, that, that episode is closed. We're not making uh, uh, monsters anymore. Other things that I do, I, ma I make stuff. I love making stuff. Now, I didn't make this phone, uh, but I did put a Raspberry Pi in it. So there is a computer in this telephone. Now, this is old technology. This is mechanics insights, and it's incredible. This is made to never break. I mean, you can 
This is even made to be explosive proof. So this is made to never, never break. But the mechanics inside, you can just dial forever, 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 and it will never break. That's incredible. And what's so cool, you can actually attach it to a modern computer and do silly stuff with it. So what did I do with this? This became a music player. So I can dial and it will tell me, for instance, Oh, uh oh, no sound. Yeah. Dial zero one to listen to Vasilis's Discover Weekly. So it's a Spotify playlist player. So I have to dial numbers and it will play music for me over my self made stereo. I made that myself as well. So I'm a bit of a nerd. I'm a bit of a, a maker. I'm a bit, maybe I'm not even a maker. I'm maybe more of an artist. So I have an artistic approach to making stuff. It doesn't have to be the way it's always been. So I like to flip things, look at things from other angles. Okay, so when I started teaching, I had to teach about the web. Uh, and I had to teach about color. Now there was a problem. If you look at my clothes, you can see they're black. And that's for a reason, because I don't understand anything about color. But I did have to teach about it. So. Well, you could read books about color, but I didn't. I decided to make a slow learning application for myself. Every day, this website generates one random colored rectangle on a random colored background. Once a day, slow learning. I've been watching this thing well, for 10 years now. And then I found out, oh wow, I can generate rectangles, that's cool. Uh, I didn't know I could do that. So then I decided I want to be able to uh, generate blobs. And it turned out that I can actually generate blobs as well. Um, this makes me very happy. This is SVG. Um, uh, uh, Jeremy talked about it yesterday a little bit. Beautiful shapes. And it turns out that all these shapes are just numbers. And numbers you can randomize and you get silly blobs. So this is how I started learning about color. Then I found out, of course, if you can generate one blob or one image a day, you can generate a hundred images, add a print style sheet to it, and then you have a book. So here is a book. <laughs> and now my server also generates a book a day. Now the thing that I like maybe most about these books is that there's a description of the image below it. A very unsaturated light magenta rectangle on a rather saturated yellow background. It's not really yellow. I mean, this is, it's not science, but I really like, I mean, I really like the web because the web is not just for me as a white guy with a beard, it's also for all of you, and it's also for people who need assistive technology, for instance. So if I make an image, I really want to make sure that everybody can use it. Even if you might think, well, blind people don't know color, but we learned from Molly that some people do have a little bit of sight and some people have memory of color, of course. So this is another thing that I made. Now, these books, this book project has been going on forever. I don't gen generate just one book every evening. I generate 10 books. So yes, indeed, I have 25,656 <laughs> books about color <laughs> and counting. So tomorrow there will be 10 more books. Uh, and if you want to, yeah, you can order them as well. I mean, <laughs> nobody does, but <laughs> it's possible. <laughs> Um, so I, I did most of this to just find out how things work, right? It's a new technology, I want to know how it works. So there's a new thing with CSS, I want to know how it works. Uh, no, there's another project. Um, this used to be a Twitter bot, now it's a Mastodon bot. Every night it tells you that the world has ended a long time ago because there were always predictions about the apocalypse. And when I'm depressed, I look at this site and I say, ah, oh, <laughs> the world has ended and it's not that bad, <laughs> right? So that's one of the bots that I made. Uh, what's this? 
Ah, this is another clock that I made. Well, this is a clock that I made. It shows the time in pictures of clocks. So I'm not sure will it take. We can wait a little bit. Now, the good thing, of course, is that uh, these are all images. There are 1,440 minutes in a day, so there should be 1,440 images in there. They're not yet. We're still filling it. If you want to, if you have images of clocks, please send them to me and I'll put them in this clock. Of course, every image has an alternative text, so you can also enjoy this with your screen reader if you really want to. Uh, every minute it will say something to you. Doesn't seem to work now. Let's refresh it. No, no, I don't know. It broke or something. Okay, so that's this one. Then I used to work, I said, at a design agency and everything there made sense. And I don't care that much about things that make sense. I love nonsense more, so I made this blog. And the nicest thing about it is that when you press the letter L, lasers come out of the eyes of the little illustration there. Um, what's this? So I make clocks. This is a clock. It's all CSS. It'll tell you the time. Wow, it's indeed called the wow clock. <laughs> oh, wow. I wish I had it, but this back then when I still smoked dope. <laughs> Binary for the nerds, a clock made of clocks. Whoa. All right, here's a typewriter clock. Very nerdy, very, very nerdy. You won't see it, but this is a variable font. Now, I don't know if you remember the typewriters. When I was a kid, they were mechanical. So these were things that were not like these keyboards. You actually had to hit hard. And I always typed with two fingers, like pop, 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 pop. But there were people who were able to type with 10 fingers. Now, I imagine that when you type with your pinky, you cannot hit as hard as when you type with the index finger, right? So here's a variable font that every letter you type with your pink is thinner than the ones that you type with your... Uh, I wrote a script for that. These details are the details that matter to me. There are also the details that nobody sees, but they are details and they are the things that matter. Uh, so I use clocks a lot. This is another clock. It's a fantastic old mechanical uh, idea from uh, the Middle Ages, I think even, very, very old mechanics, uh, and you can recreate them with CSS. Here, I knew that you can animate something along a path, but I'd never done it before, so I learned it by playing with clocks. Ah, okay, let's get back to what I wanted to talk about. I want to talk about the design tools that we use in our uh, industry. Anybody here use Figma? Ooh, quite a few of them. Okay, uh, pay attention. <laughs> okay, so the tools we'll be using. Ten years ago, my colleagues at the design agency who were responsible for the visual design, so we had a, a special division for visual design of the websites, they used Photoshop. Now, I was always amazed that they used Photoshop. Photoshop is not designed to make websites. It's very good for pixel manipulation, it's very good for photo manipulation, but not for creating websites. But still, all web designers back then used Photoshop. I hated it. I hated Photoshop, I hated my colleagues, I hated what they did with it. It was awful. So, I said to them, just learn CSS and let's make stuff that we can actually make. Don't come up with fantasies about the web. So they made rounded corners. There were no rounded corners in CSS. They came up with silly things like gradients, gradients. There were no gradients in CSS. Box shadows, blend modes, custom typography, of course, all impossible. So we came up with hacks. But the good thing is, the CSS working group actually started working. And they started making 
specifications. And then the other good thing is there came more browsers and more rendering engines, and they started working as well. And now we have all these features that our uh, designers back then fantasized. Now, this is a good thing. So in hindsight, I love Photoshop as a design tool for the web because it was a very progressive uh, tool. It made us do stuff that we couldn't do. We designed stuff that we couldn't make. I think this is a good thing. Now we have Figma. Figma is much more the tool that I would have loved to have back then because Figma is based on what we can do with the web, right? It is everything you can come up with with Figma is something that we can actually build with current web technologies. The problem is though that it stays there. You cannot do stuff that we haven't uh, uh, done yet. So it's basically a bit like an AI, right? It repeats stuff that we have done, but it cannot come up with new stuff. Now this is a problem, I think. So Figma, while it is a good thing, will never get us forward as long as they don't put new technology in there, as long as they don't put the new things in there. Now there's another thing that I think is a problem with all design tools that we have, is they treat the web as if it's a static image. But I don't think the web is a static image. It's never static. You still always design a large image, but nobody ever sees a large image. You still design it as one thing, but it's, the web is actually more, I think, maybe even like a sculpture. So this is something we can easily design with both Photoshop and with Figma, of course, right? This is not hard to design, but can we design this? I think we can't. And I really wish we could. I really wish that you don't need me as a complete nerd to come up with stuff like this. This should be possible with uh, uh, design tools, to come up with stuff like this, to think about what happens when we start scrolling, uh, what happens, uh, right, that, that you have these weird shapes and that we, these shapes stay where they are. This is possible with CSS. This is impossible with the tools that we have. Um, so we need better tools, if you ask me, from a visual point of view. Now, there's another thing that these tools are very bad at, um, and that's, for instance, semantics. These tools don't care about semantics. Now, that doesn't matter very much because most people don't care about semantics. If you look at the web, right? Look at any source of any website, and it's just random stuff, uh, random heading levels, random elements. Uh, uh, semantics are hard. Now, I gave an assignment to my students a while ago. They had to make a website. Uh, these are not the technical students. These are more the visual students. And one of the students asked, um, Vasilis, do we need to make this site semantic and shit? And I said, nope. <laughs> it doesn't have to be semantic and shit, but it does have to be well considered, of course, right? The user experience must be considered. So, and this of course is a bit, it's the same thing if you ask me. It shouldn't be about semantics, it should be about the UX of HTML. So the semantics means, if you ask me, semantic HTML is what does an element mean? I don't care what it means, I care, what, I care about what it does. What does this element do to the user experience, right? If the, the difference between a section and a div well, it's theoretic, right? It's something that we can talk about with a few beers, uh, but it's not important. It doesn't really matter to anybody uh, who uses your website. And I care about the people who use my website. So, for instance, I sometimes look with my students at uh, how does this work? So this is blue text with an underline. Uh, we can make those things in uh, uh, Photoshop, of course, uh, but this in, on the web, of course, is the all famous link. Now, this is a link in a web site. In a web app, of course, it works like this. And I do this experiment with my students. 
is there a difference? Is there a difference between the link and the span with an on-click? Well, there, there are quite a few differences. So we do this experiment where we try to recreate the link. And I hope that this illustrates the uh, power of UX of HTML. So you have this on-click, but this only works on click, so that you need actually to have a mouse or a pointer, pointer device. So we need a tab index to add to it, and we need a role of link to tell the engine that this is actually a, a link. You can click on it. Uh, so this is the first part. Then uh, we need to style it, of course, so we make it blue with a text decoration of underline. Then we make, want to make it purple once you've clicked on the link, of course, right? This is a nice property of links. Uh, unfortunately, the visited state doesn't work on a span, so we have to write this piece of JavaScript to uh, uh, emulate a visited state, and then we find out that a link has a context menu, its own context menu, and a span doesn't have this context menu. So then we read this very, 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 very long article about how to make your own context menu, which concludes, it concludes actually with, you probably shouldn't do it, right? And it, just at the end, it says you probably shouldn't do it. Uh, and then you make this context menu, and then you find out that every browser has their own context menu for a link. Good luck with creating that. I think this is actually impossible to do. And then, ah, does this actually work? With, uh, does my span now end up in the list of links in a screen reader? I don't know. I haven't tested. I think it doesn't. I don't think the role equals link makes it end up in the list of links in the screen reader. So we, after all this work, we fuck it up anyway. Oh, give us the link, right? Use the link. That's UX. That's what it's about. And this is the difference between a, uh, a span and a link. This is, well, I don't care about semantics. This is UX. And then I show them things like the form. My, Students love forms. Let's see, where is it? Here it is. They, well, they hate forms, but when I show them things like this, that CSS in combination with HTML is very nice. So here we have a nice form. So usually we leave the error messages over to developers. And what happens then is that we get, I think this clock is a bit distracting, isn't it? Let's hide it. So uh, error messages are written by developers, and sometimes you get things like, oh, fuck you, you did it wrong, as an error message. It's your fault, wrong. And actually, this is the way we validate forms. If it's wrong, after the fact, you get uh, to hear wrong. Now, as a teacher, I've learned that this is not the way to stimulate people to finish their task. Right? There are better ways to do that. So instead of saying, you're wrong, you can say, hey, that's nice. You filled in a few letters. It's turning green now. And you, oh, good. That's nice. You're making progress here. This works, actually. This is just me as a teacher teaching you, right? So do this kind of stuff. Then when you ask for an email, everybody knows that I hate it when I have to fill in my uh, email and my keyboard doesn't change, that I have to type something and then I have to switch the keyboard, find the at sign, and right? Oh, oh switch back, of course. And, okay, my students know this. So I show them, well, it's not really semantics. Well, it is semantics, but it's UX. I show them UX. I show them the user experience of HTML. They love this stuff. And I think that when we stop talking about semantics and shit, my students will stop asking, does it have to be semantic and shit? They will just, and if we just start talking about the UX of HTML, they will maybe even start loving HTML. Okay, so that's that part. Uh, where's my thing? 
So the tools that we use don't care about the user experience, and I think they should, just like you should. Uh, so I really hope for the next decade that in 10 years we'll be able to be here and present these wonderful tools that actually do care about the user experience and that add all these invisible layers uh, to our design tooling. Another thing that these tools don't care at all about, I think, is accessibility. Now, and this is something that I actually think that the whole industry, and not only our industry, but almost every industry, is not very good at. So this is a new building uh, of our university. This is the old building. This is the new one. I always invite people over uh, to do... Um, um, uh, to work with. I'll talk about that later. Okay, so, new building. The building is actually certified accessible. So it, it's completely accessible according to the specification of builders, right? We have the WCAG, they have something else. It ticks all boxes. Now, when we zoom into the entrance, you'll see that there's actually stairs to get in. Now, I wonder, how does that take any box? I mean, if I'm in a wheelchair, how do I get up there? There's a lift here, and the lift, it works uh, most of the time, uh, but it's also very, very slow. So if you want to get up there with a, a wheelchair, it will take five minutes. Five minutes! And that did take a box. Now then it's very hard to get in. These, uh, these, these, these doors are actually too small for a wheelchair, so you have to ring a bell, and the bell goes somewhere, and then somebody has to come and open the door. It, it, takes, it takes probably 10 minutes to get in. Then here is a cafe. It's a nice cafe, and it's got very, very good coffee. So what most people do, we enter the door, we go to the right, have a coffee. Now, if you want to enter the cafe, there's two stairs going down. So they made another lift. So <laughs> now, if you want to have a cup of coffee and you're in a wheelchair, you actually have to take another lift. That one is a bit faster, but it makes a lot of noise. So you, on Monday morning, a bit grumpy, I need a coffee, you go onto the lift and it goes, <coughs> everybody's looking at you, what's this noisemaker? This is just terrible design, and this could have been prevented so easily by just involving people who need to enter the building and not just fantasizing about how people enter the building or not just ticking boxes. The architect, actually, of this uh, building was shocked uh, because he thought we did a good thing. We ticked all the boxes, we actually hired an expert bureau to help us make this thing accessible, and then um, they made a movie about it even, a, a small documentary. They asked two people with wheelchairs uh, to go into the building with the architect. Here's a link if you want to watch it. Uh, and it's shocking. It's, it's even worse. There's just horrible, horrible design decisions in this building. It's a beautiful building, but from a UX point of view, it's terrible. Um, so... That's that. That's something that we can learn from. Don't do this stuff, right? Don't just tick boxes. Um, now, on the web, for the last 20 years, every article I read, or many articles I read about the web, are about doing, uh, making your websites accessible, that it's important to make your website accessible, right? And we do so by, by adding semantic HTML to our websites, of course and to add heading levels and to add navigations and things like that. And now there's a visualization here of what this website looks like or he, what, it, yeah, what it, it changes into when you use a screen reader. It will read out things like heading level 2 or heading level 4 or up there a list with so many items or a navigation. Um, now, I have been um, uh, testing websites with real people uh, with different disabilities. And it turns out that many of them don't know what heading levels are. So you use this, this one guy. 
I was watching him using a screen reader, and I saw him getting frustrated, and he said, I hate the web. I hate the web. And I asked him, why? Why? The web is fantastic. I mean, it's accessible for everybody. No. There's all these words in there. Why do you put all these words in there? He thought that we designed the web like this, that it looks like this, that we see heading level two everywhere. But he hears all these things. He hears all these words, and he doesn't know what it means. And of course he doesn't know what it means. A normal person doesn't have to know what a navigation is, right? He just has to know, I have to click on these things. They don't need to know the word. Uh, they don't need to know what a heading level is. So our WCAG, the WCAG is brilliant and it's fantastic, but it's also very much aimed at nerds. It's designed by nerds, for nerds, for power users. And we forgot that most of the people who use the web are not nerds. They don't care about computers at all. And they shouldn't care about computers. We should care about them, though. Now, this is a different, difficult question. I don't have an answer. I don't know how to fix this because it's very, very complicated. This is maybe even a wicked problem, uh, but it's really, really complex. But we should be thinking about this. Just adding heading levels doesn't fix stuff. One of the things we can do is don't add too many headings. 80 headings doesn't help anybody, right? 150 links. Yeah, you need that one link, but I'm not going to tell where it is. It's one of the 150. Good luck finding it, right? This is. We can design this stuff, we can think about it. And what I think we always forget on the web, and what, we, what I really think we should be starting to do, is accessibility is not about a, a list of things, it's about people. And we need to involve these people, not only for testing, uh, but also in the complete design process. Bring them in to our design process. Bring them into our studios. Uh, make them our colleagues. Uh, because... <laughs> Thanks. Right? We shouldn't be designing for people. We should be designing with people, if you ask me. I think this is really, really, really very, very important. And I really believe that we've forgotten about this. We haven't done this. So here's... And, and, and if you start working with people, it's often quite shocking. So this is a video of uh, a man that I've worked with, an artist, uh, who's going to show me, so he's going to click on Geluidsprojecten over there, and then there's an audio player, and he's going to play the audio player. Now, this is something he is actually... He knows a little bit about computers. He knows how screen readers work. He just forgot how, for instance, you can let the heading levels show up. He forgot how you can skip through uh, uh, the page uh, faster. He forgot about it because he's not a power user. He's used the feature once or twice and then didn't use it anymore, didn't know how to use it, forgot about it, and uses the browser in his own way like most people do. Now, this is a depressing video. Sorry about that. 89 links. 25 headings. 9 form controls. 10 landmarks. SER Webaria article scant multi. Whatever that was. Visited link image. Geluid in zicht. Link audio maquette. Link ontstaansgeschiedenis. Link meerwaarde audio maquette. Link nieuwe gebouwen. Link rondleidingen. Link rondleidingen voor groepen. Link luisterdagen. Visited link geluid en beeld. Link, archief. Link, contact and colophon. Visit it, link, geluidsprojecten. There's the link, he clicks on it. Geluidsproject, geluidsprojecten, geluid en zicht, page has. He's gonna 43 click on this one. 21 headings. 33 form controls. 10 landmarks. 1 artikel. Visit it, link, image. Geluid en zicht. Link, audio maquette. Link, ontstaansgeschiedenis. Link, meerwaarde audio maquette. Link, nieuwe gebouwen. Link, rondleidingen. Link, rondleidingen voor groepen. Link, luisterdagen. Visit dit link, geluid en beeld. Link, archief. Link, contact en colophon. Visit dit link, geluidsprojecten. Audio player, web application, with zes aantons. There it is. Play button.
Doe eens je ogen dicht. Wat zie je nu? Niks. En wat denk je, wat is het als je blind wordt? Wat zie je dan? Niks. That's it. That would have taken us two seconds, max, right? Uh, it takes him this much longer, actually, every time, because uh, well, when I sat uh, next to him, he first clicked on the wrong link. Then he navigated through the page, and after a while he found out, oh, this is not the page where I have to be. So he back button, clicked on the right thing, came at the audio player, clicked on the wrong button, and it opened a dialog, and it said, are you sure you want to download? What is it called? Do your own gedicht, five, five, six, seven, final, really final, 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 dot mp3. And he was like, what's happening? And all his normal keys didn't work anymore. So he didn't know what was going on. He didn't know what a dialogue was. Of course, he didn't know because nerds don't need to know what a dialogue is. And he solved it by restarting his computer. And this is a slow computer. And I asked him, do you restart your computer often? Yes, all the time. You don't? He didn't know that this was not a normal user experience. We should be designing this stuff. So this is especially for everybody who still thinks that it's a good pattern to put the navigation on top. I disagree. <laughs> and every time you disagree with me, I'll send you this video. <laughs> so I redesigned uh, the website. I removed the navigation, uh, I made it a bit boring. And I said, OK, this is boring. So then uh, Hannes, the guy I worked for, he said, I want with every audio project, I want a little animation, a little illustration, a fun illustration uh, to go with it. And I said, well, you can see it. Yeah, but I still want it. OK. How do you make invisible animations? Well, of course, you start by reversing it and you make the alternative text first. So this is not, it's actually, you make the text first and an alternative animation. I like that. So it's uh, the, the actually image sources in the alt attribute. Um, so this is one, the ferries of Amsterdam, and it goes like this. Ha, look at that. Two ferries are ferrying from one side of the screen to the other, bouncing. Boing, 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 against the sides of the browser. He had to laugh so hard because you hear these voices are so neutral and the whole web and the whole computer system is so neutral. If it's a funny website, it's neutral. And if it's a very serious website, it's as neutral as the funny one, which is, of course, not how the web is, right? So you can design this stuff. And, well, here's the animation, and you can put animations over your text. They don't need to be in the white space. They can be anywhere. Uh, a hammer. Ha, 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 ha. There's a hammer that slowly ticks the text down a bit. You can make your screen readers giggle. We should make them giggle, right? Uh, we're giggling. Let's make our screen readers giggle. And it's actually not that hard. Did you know that you can let your... You can... Boing, 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 boing. You can prototype, right? You can even say, well, let's hear what this sounds like in Scottish. Boing, 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 boing. Oh, sounds good, right? So you can prototype uh, what it sounds like in your screen reader by using the say command in your terminal on the Mac. It's pretty easy. You can even record it if you want to. It would be something like output and then a boing.m4a. Oh, and now you have a file called boing. And you can use that in your presentations, just like I did right now. So this is a prototyping tool to design for um, uh, screen readers. We can do that. We should be doing that. OK, this is what it looks like. And every time an animation pops up, the description is read out to anybody who uses a screen reader. Um, I do other stuff. I ask my students to make stuff with this as well. So there's closed captions. You've heard about closed captions that you, when you watch a movie, uh, it describes somebody is knocking on the door. I mean, it doesn't describe if it's a Nazi alien from hell or your neighbor asking for a cup of sugar. Somebody's knocking on the door. So I said, this can be made more visual. I want the emotion and the detail that's in that sound, I want that visible. 
So uh, here's what one of my students came up with, a brilliant, brilliant student. So he said, yeah, let's make this better than the original movie. So he looked at the uh, original cartoons and he took over how these cartoons are laid out and turned that into this wonderful, wonderful CSS prototype. Incredible, he made this. This is fantastic. I could have never come up with this stuff. Um, so cool. And our tools will never make us able, uh, uh, give us, the, uh, will never, uh, we won't have the visual tools to do this. We need, and we need them, I think. We need to be able to think outside of what it looks like, but we have to go further. Now, there's one final thing that I want to talk about, and that's CSS. So I think when it comes to semantics, when it comes to accessibility, we need much, much, much better tools, and we need to look at people instead of ourselves. Now, when it comes to CSS, there's another thing going on. CSS has become much more powerful than our tools. We can do stuff that we don't know. We don't know that we can do certain stuff. There is stuff that can be done that's unknown. So we need a more artistic approach to web design, if you ask me. Um, just doing the normal stuff is um, not good enough. There are other people who are as old as I am here. Now, back when I was a kid, we didn't have phones to look at. So we had other stuff that moved, like clocks. Uh, and I would look at clocks. I was an expert in watching clocks. I was really, really good at it. Now, one of the things you get good at is once it hits the mark, it's beautiful when it, wah, yes, it touches it and that's, it's lined out perfectly. The problem, of course, I had a rectangular or a square watch is when it's seven and a half minutes later, it's nowhere near the indicator. That's a problem, isn't it? Uh, uh, well, I'm obviously the only one who thinks it's a problem. I think this is a very big problem. Now, the nice thing with CSS is that we can actually solve this. Look at it. <laughs> yes. We can solve this. And that one is growing as well. Oh, look. We solved the problem of square clocks. Isn't that amazing? Nobody knew it existed, but <laughs> we solved it. What I think is wonderful with this particular clock is now these two hands are the same length, exactly the same length. This is wonderful, and still you see that it's a clock. Isn't it beautiful? And then when you play around with it a little bit, uh, uh, it becomes something like, let's see. Oh, fuck, no internet. Oh, no. Oh, a wrong, <laughs> wrong URL, sorry. I'll find it, I'll find it. Clocks, diagon. Here, look at that. Isn't that beautiful? It's the same clock, just different styling. We should play more with CSS, if you ask me. We should come up with this type of crazy stuff. We should do more artistic uh, research instead of only our practical research and only, we shouldn't think just about KPIs, we should also think about what could it be and what do we want it to be and what if, all these kinds of questions uh, are very important as well if we want to be here in 10 years and not be very, very grumpy uh, by then. <laughs> um, so let's see. Uh, yeah, and I asked my students, for instance, to create stuff as well. This is something that a colleague of mine made. This is his homepage. This is the most horrible user experience ever. This is actually whack-a-mole. So if you want to click on something, you have to be fast. And it's also, it's, it's even evil. So I told him, no, this has to work with keyboard. So when you go tabbing, he says, nope, it's whack-a-mole. You have to whack it. You're not allowed to use it with your keyboard. He made it even worse. Well, it's not good, but it is good, right? There's, there's lots of 
detail in here. He makes fantastic stuff. Things like this. We can do this. You can actually tap. This is better than the original on the Mac, right? This works. Beautiful. Uh, what else? Ah, this is something my students make. So I gave, give them a, an assignment to make stuff that we don't know we can do. And one of the things they are allowed to do is make a Rubik's Cube that works. But they're not allowed to use JavaScript. Now, uh, this is one student. He said, I don't want to make a Rubik's Cube, but I'll make a computer that works. And you can actually click on all these buttons. It's 3D. It's incredible. I don't know how she does it, but she does it. This is a two-week program, right? So these are students that just start uh, doing this. Um, this one. This one. Should, where is it? Mm. Okay, let's zoom in a little bit. And this is about the details. So you tap to it, and then look at how that animated. There's so much detail in there. Whoop. And look at this, this kitty thing. Whoop. <laughs> look at how that works. This is all CSS. There is not a line of JavaScript in there. Uh, CSS and HTML, of course. What would happen with this one? Ah. <laughs> Wonderful, isn't it? I'm so proud of my students who come up with this ridiculous nonsense. Now, the thing that really, really annoys me is this is a, a very talented developer, but also a very, very talented designer with a fantastic attention to detail. There's no way that you can even come up with uh, something like this with the visual design tools that we have uh, for our designers. She now works as a React Native developer. Come on, industry, don't do this. What happened? Why are there no places for technical designers, for people who actually know how it works and how it should look? There are no places for these people. I have them, but there's no jobs for them, and they have to choose. You either become a designer and you work with Figma, or you would become a developer and you make rubbish. It's <laughs> awful. <laughs> Please fix it. I want to be here again in 10 years <laughs> and have a, a happy talk about the beautiful stuff that we can do. Okay, thanks. <laughs>